Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up hill. Welcome to episode 8 of Once Upon a Nightmare. I am your host Lorraine and I'm here to discuss the horrors of the world, be it fictional or real. This week I'm going fictional where I'm going to chat about vampires. That's right, it's the movie Blade. You better wake up. The world you live in is just a sugar-coated topper. There is another world beneath it. The real world. thousands of years they have existed among us you keep your eyes open they're everywhere chances are you've seen them yourself and didn't know it a secret nation our livelihood depends on our ability to blend in with a lust for power we should be ruling the humans these people are our food they've got their claws into everything politics finance real estate there's a war going on out there he makes the weapons i use them now, one will lead them to conquer mankind. Tonight, the age of man comes to an end. We're gonna be gods. And one will try to stop him dead. There are worse things out tonight than vampires. Like what? Like me. Half human. Blade's mother was attacked by a vampire while she was pregnant. Half immortal. You got the best of both worlds. All our strengths. None of our weaknesses. He is their greatest fear and our only hope. It's open season on all vampires. Wesley Snipes, Stephen Dorff. You're one of them, aren't you? No, I'm something else. Blade is an action horror. It's an 18 and it goes on for about two hours and I myself watched it on Amazon Prime. It was released in 1998 and directed by a Stephen Norton. It was made with a budget of about $45 million and it made over $131 million at the box office. It stars the great Wesley Snipes as Blade. He is a half human with also the strength of a vampire. Blade, along with his mentor, Abraham Whistler, who is played by Chris Christopherson, spends their days trying to take down a vampire race that has taken over the world. But he also wants to exact revenge for the death of his mother at the hands of vampires who died while giving birth to him after being bitten. Blade's main enemy is an out of control vampire who is just a bit too ambitious for his own good that is Deacon Frost he is played by Stephen Dorff Blade then meets and saves a hematologist and that is a Dr Karen Jensen she is played by a sorry if I pronounce this wrong but a Enboshe Wright she has been bitten when attacked in hospital while at work and she is then rescued by Blade barely alive she soon becomes his shadow so he can protect her long enough for her to find a cure and not be hunted and killed by the other vampires Just to let you know, throughout this episode, there will be spoilers. So when talking about movies, I've started to put out a few feelers to see what people think of Blade and a couple of people come back to me. So I have Eric at Bearded Geek 19, second best vampire film after The Lost Boys. The Lost Boys is very good. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. (laughs) Best quote in the movie. Yep, that is a good quote. And he says it so well. Delito at The Great Picnic underappreciated gem Norrington should have done the sequels no one and I mean no one today can do action the way Snipes did back in the day the man has swag the character of Blade aka Eric Roberts first came to light in a comic book The Tomb of Dracula in July 1973 and it was part of the Marvel comics it was created by writer Marv Wolfman and artist Gene Colan he was at first a supporting character, but went on to become a main character, getting his own storylines. He is a daywalker, being half human and half vampire, and we may see him out and about in the daylight. With the Blade movies, which there are currently three, 
and now there will be a reboot but unfortunately not with uh wesley snipes as the main role for me snipes he is blade he's such an iconic character and he kind of paved the way i think sometimes for like future marvel characters and to be honest i think he'd still be able to pull it off even though i think he's like pushing well he's not 60 but he's near it and the guy is ripped plus i think when it comes to snipes which very few people can do in my opinion wesley snipes is cool and blade while he can do all the tricks and kick ass and swords and stuff he's got such style that being that cool and i don't think you can kind of i think you either have it or you don't basically for me the word cool kind of gets thrown around like something everyone wants to be but i don't think there's that many cool people out there obviously we have you know samuel L. jackson sam elliott um wesley snipes so the guy who's going to play it is Mahershala ali and uh, is he cool now this guy is a great actor and i will watch this movie with him in it he's going to be taking on the lead role as blade but to be honest i do save my opinions about films like this until the end i will need to see can he pull off that cool star that we like to see in blade that we see wesley slipes do so well and you know i've kind of read a few things people do tend to lose their shit when such big changes you know come out it kind of baffles me when everyone kind of loses their shit look at ben affleck when uh, he became batman and i actually liked it um you know when we have christopher reeve's superman and henry cavill came along and nailed it but no one can play lex luther like gene hackman but i am excited to see what they do with it you know someone on twitter actually suggested that snipes plays uh, the mentor the whistler character and i think that's actually a really good idea and i think if they're not going to have wesley snipes as blade in this reboot then he has to be in it in some way you know he needs to be involved and he's that freaking good so let's just see what they do with that but back to this movie which wesley snipes is in and looks very cool the movie opens up with a pregnant woman bleeding out as she gives birth to a little boy that is of course eric brooks aka blade after this scene we then move on to one of my most favorite and yet terrifying club scenes in a movie and while writing this i never knew this i saw that a nightclub in new york city called terminal 5 actually reenacted this this uh, whole blood scene as a as a nod to blade with fake blood coming from the ceiling no no not for me thank you but the cinematographer for blade is a theo van der sande and he really nails this scene for the dark and scene underworld that it is even when we see this this guy and this girl tracy lords walk through this kind of avatar there's like meat hanging synthetic light you know at that stage i'd probably turn around and say no thank you and then they get to go into this other room where there's people like dancing they're smooching there's a few inappropriate sex acts in public and you kind of get a feeling that this is not going to be a good outcome there's this amazing dance tune playing in the background that's of course new order's confusion and it's like pounding through everyone's veins as you can Sorry for saying this phrase, but you can really see that they're feeling the music. Most of the people are dressed in black and white, but this young man who has arrived in with Lords, he's in a red coat, this like berry thing. He looks very nerdy. He looks very out of place. And people make it very clear that he's not welcome. He's like very excited to be there. And he almost can't believe his luck that this hot girl has taken him there. He's even had a little bit of a smooch before they go in. So he definitely thinks that there's some interest there. So he's happy to follow her into this like sketchy room and he's so unaware of his surroundings. But for now, he was caught up in the moment, so he just went with it. But then he soon realises that all is not right as these drops of red stuff kind of falls from the ceiling and like any normal person, he has a little taste. Why? And then it rains down on them. Everyone is dripping in this blood and loving it. He tries to leave and then realises that these people now have fangs coming out of their teeth And he kind of gets beaten along the floor. But as he crawls along the floor, luckily for him, there is a mysterious man dressed in a long black coat, black clothes, black shoes, and looking beyond bloody amazing. And then we have a slight grin and Blade then shows us what he is capable of. That is what I love about what this cinematographer does. He does a great job at making us feel nervous for this guy. But as the hero reveals himself and starts with the sword, we know we're in a safe place. We know that we're in the safety of Blade. The build-up is so intense as you feel with all those people that this lad, you know, I thought he was actually going to be ripped to pieces and bitten to pieces. I didn't think what was going to happen to him actually happened to him. Actually, I didn't think he was going to survive there is nowhere for him to go he's blinded by all this blood the place is 
packed. It's all in his eyes and all over his face and the floor is all slippy. And I have to say, I absolutely love this scene because, I mean, the whole film is just amazing. But this scene is just, it's actually one of my favourite scenes in cinema history. I think they do it so well. And I think the music really adds to that. And, you know, this film is full of extremes. It's got over the top half-blood vampires so much blood everywhere so much energy and of course we have these amazing extreme fight scenes i personally love martial arts when a film and when it's done well you know it's like watching this perfect dance you know snipes himself has been doing martial arts i didn't realize it was this young but since the age of 12 and he's like a fifth degree black belt in shikan karate sorry i'm saying that wrong and also a secondary black belt in a hapkido probably saying that wrong too and he's also trained in other disciplines such as kickboxing and Brazilian Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So the fact he's so well trained really adds to like this authenticity of his portrayal of Blade. And he really knows how to hold himself with like the movement of his body, the way he controls his ac- actions. And, you know, we've also got more extremes in the clothes, the sets, the characters, and you get such a like visceral reaction to it all. As the club scene ends... There was a mention of a half vampire, half human, and that is Deacon Frost. Frost has such ambition of what it means to be a vampire within this human-based world. He sets about trying to change how it's done for vampires. But Frost has a rival within the vampire world, and this is a true vampire. So he's a true blood, and that's Dragonetti. And Dragonetti, he, he wants things to stay as they are, and Frost is not having it. I can't really recall a film about vampires off the top of my head quite like this one so you know if there is one let me know I mean I haven't seen the Twilight movies or watched you know the show True Blood or anything like that so maybe maybe they are like that but you know when we watch vampire movies things you know it seems to be based like around this fantasy but what I mean is like you know how they can be destroyed and stuff like that you know and all the kind of like stakes and all that kind of stuff but within this film it while it does have all those aspects of what we're used to with vampire films it also has a real big scientific element vibe to it and all the usual vampire themes don't necessarily apply yeah we do have the weapons associated like i said with like killing vampires you've got your garlic mace you've got your stakes you've got your silver bullets you've got your blades etc but blade in his quest to like kill all the vampires uses weapons but he also uses science like the woman he's helping survive is a hematologist dr karen jensen and she questions whistler as to what kills them she's like stakes crosses and he explains that crosses actually don't do much but some of the legends are true but when he's talking about you know destroying them he talks about like things like he says allergies rather than simply saying you kill them so for instance with the garlic garlic they could go into anaphylactic shock you know you've got your sunlight in your ultraviolet rays and he's also saying they're allergic to silver and they discuss cures with vampires and you know we always tend to think of vampires as things that can be destroyed they can't become human again And, uh, you know, so it's like, I'm going to try it out. No, I don't like it. Put me back to human again. But with this, it's kind of like all bets are off because they can be cured. But having said that, it doesn't take away from the vampire thing for me. I still like what they've done with it. Vampires move in with scientific times, if you will. Blade takes a more scientific viewpoint and emphasizes the weapons that they already, you know, use towards vampires. Whereas Frost is kind of more about the mythology of vampires, even going even going against the actual full vampires like the the elders the real vampires have absolutely zero respect for this breed of a younger half vampire and frost he doesn't care he doesn't care what they think about him so so much so he actually takes one of the older like elders of the real bloods and he he just executes him he leaves him out in the sun and there's kind of like this other side to it as well like with the with the humans that aren't quite the vampires yet and they want to serve these half bloods but they have no idea how to behave and this is really evident um when we see how stupid they actually are and this is with that policeman i think krieger was his name when he tries to attack dr jensen in her apartment you know of course his plan fails and blade is there to save the day and interrogates him but he's like this bloody low life who he's a slave to the half-bloods and he's got so little worth that he basically once he messes up he's killed because it becomes clear that they can't trust him they can't get what they want from him to be fair the idiot cop was up against Blade. So like, you know, chomp, chomp on the neck and into the pool you go. You're of no use to us. I do hate, though, after all this, what happens to Whistler. I really liked his character. Frost and, you know, his group of idiots go to Blade's hangout and they really fuck Whistler up and they take Jensen. Blade comes back to find his mentor in a bad state and knows that Nistler, 
Whistler, Nistler, Whistler needs to take himself out. Whistler does kill himself. And this is when Blade has even more of a reason to take Frost down. You know, he grabs his syringes laced with Dr. Jensen's EDTA and he goes off to kill him. Vampires seem to vary through different portrayals we see, though. Some playing down what we think a vampire to be. Others going, you know, by the book, so to speak. I'll be honest, when I think of vampires, I'm more of a stake through the heart, holy water crosses and garlic kind of girl. But it doesn't seem to always be the case. Like watching films such as Interview with a Vampire, they they too have gone against some of the myths. It's not in such a more uh, a scientific way that we see with Blade, but like, for instance, Louis, how he discusses he has a fondness for looking at crucifixes. You know, he calls a stake through the heart nonsense. But then we have films like The Lost Boys and they go all out of what you kind of think it is. They've got the holy water, they've got the garlic, they've got the stakes. You don't invite them into your home. And I personally love both aspects on it. And I'm a fan of the genre in general, but I do like with Blade how they've kind of taken it a different way. We're bringing in this whole science element to it. One thing about Frost's gang, though, that, oh my God, it annoys me so much, is I fucking hate them. They're so arrogant. There is nothing pleasant about them at all. And I think sometimes when watching vampire films, there is a kind of, I don't know, arrogance, snobbiness, holier than thou, we're better than everybody vibe about them. And the head real vampire, he he tries to kind of keep some sort of order with this lot, but they're basically a bunch of out of control morons, have just way too much power and they really don't know how to handle it. And one character in particular is, of course, Quinn. When he finds out that they're going to be like these, you know, epic gods type thing, and he says, I'm going to be naughty. I'm going to be a naughty vampire god. He is the guy that won't shut up. He is the guy that if you committed an awful crime... He's the one that would land you in it because he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. And they keep trying to kill him, but he just keeps bouncing back. They are a group where rules don't apply. And like any group like this, that will be their downfall. And, you know, in the end, it is. Quinn is basically just along for the ride. Like most of them, he just wants to have fun. And he doesn't really care about the whole vampire thing like Frost. It's kind of like he just wants the power, but that's how he's got it, if you know what I mean. Whereas Frost does believe in it all and the whole vampire thing, he might not necessarily have the right attitude towards it, but he does truly want to be a vampire for being a vampire. Quinn just wants to be a fucking vampire playboy, basically. Frost, he, as I mentioned, takes us down the mythology route compared to Blade, who I said more science-based route. Frost wants to summon La Magra. This is a very powerful ancient blood god. And to do this, he needs to sacrifice the elder purebloods. And once this is done, uh, Frost then becomes, he comes taken over by La Magra. And I have to say, to say this thing's meant to be the most powerful thing going, he does get taken down pretty quickly. Okay, I'll give, you know, there are parts where he gets cut in half and his body just, you know, goes back together. His arm gets chopped off and simply grows back really quickly. His body just kind of puts itself back together again. So you think, how is Blade going to get rid of him? So, you know, they're like draining the blood of Blade and that drops on Frost. And that's when he becomes this and the whole fucking shit hits the fan then. And Frost is no longer Frost when we see his eyes turn red and his fangs are like, bah, they're there. So while everyone is losing their shit and the true bloods are being destroyed and Frost is becoming something else, Blade is actually fighting his mom. Yes, she wasn't dead after all. She's been with Frost and she tries to manipulate Blade, but he doesn't quite buy it and he does destroy her. All of Frost's followers, they're like panicking and they're legging it around and all the spirits are racing through the air and they're popping through his body and they do not at this particular time want to be part of this. Like they are running off like fucking headless chickens and then it kind of all settles and Blade must now destroy the not anymore Frost. And before this happens, we finally get what we want out of this whole entire film. He fucking kills Quinn. That was my favourite part. And while all this is going on and Blade is kicking everyone's ass, we have a yet another amazing soundtrack. That's one thing I love about the movie is the music. It really pumps you up like with these amazing dance tunes while he's fighting. And it just makes such a difference. Frost, to be fair, he does put up a really good fight with Blade. But I do feel that, you know, he is the almighty power for Blood God and could have lasted a bit longer maybe not so powerful after all because Jensen's EDTA potion it does the job quite nicely and Frost kind of he kind of just starts bubbling away red going bigger and everything and then he just simply explodes but when this has happened I've noticed like one of his legs the box like from the knee down 
it doesn't really do anything. So I always thought that was quite strange. <laughs> While Blade has defeated what was in front of him, though, he does know that he is not yet done. There are more vampires out there and there is still a war going on. So when Jensen is like, I need to get back to my lab, I need to get the cure, he doesn't want the cure. He wants a better serum. And this is how she can actually help Blade. The end is set in Moscow and Blade witnesses a man trying to attack a woman. And this guy's obviously a vampire. And we then see like this shot. I love this shot. It's a perfect shot of Blade kind of in the cold and you've got the night sky and the snow's fallen off him and he just kind of looks up and says something. And I love this full body shot in the distance. And it then ends. He draws his sword one more time, leaving us with yet another great tune. And obviously the end of Blade, the first one, leaves room for Blade 2, as we know that that actually happens. And then we actually get a three. And now there's a four in the mix. With Blade overall, I really enjoy this film every time I see it. I will watch it again and again. And I'm going to see what happens with four. I really do hope Snipes is involved as he is Blade, as I've said, and has made this into such an iconic character and I feel like he definitely deserved to be recognized in the new one. I personally like the idea of him being some form of mentor but to be honest if I have my way he would just play Blade again you know but I am interested to see what Ali does with it Um, because like I said he's a really good actor and I just need to see can he pull off the coolness of Wesley Snipes. So that is my little take on Blade and now to move on to something else that is my podcast recommendation for the week. The podcast I'm going to talk about is one that I found a few months ago and is, of course, a true crime based one. And it covers really interesting cases and it really keeps you engaged. Plus, the girl that does it, she's really supportive on Twitter and she's always promoting content for other people. So please check out Riddle Me That, a true crime podcast. Hey, listeners, are you a fan of true crime? If you are listening to this podcast, then you most certainly are. During these strange times, are you looking for a new true crime podcast? Then you have found your new true crime obsession. My podcast, Riddle Me That True Crime, covers both older cases as well as current ones. I cover both well-known and more obscure cases, such as the strange death of Blair Adams, the cyanide coffee murder of Myrna Salihin, and the disappearance of Sri Lanka's richest man, Upali Wijewardene. Riddle Me That True Crime is available on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you. Now back to the show. So I would like to say thank you for listening. And don't forget to rate and review on iTunes. You can find me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, Twitter and Letterboxd as a Nightmare Pod, email as Once Upon a Nightmare Pod at gmail.com and WordPress as Once Upon a Nightmare. And I am thinking about doing the whole Facebook thing. But I'm not sure yet. I probably will. I'm not a fan of Facebook, but I thought, fuck it. Anyway, I will chat to you all soon. Have a nice week. Bye-bye.